So in Texas, we've had feral hogs on the landscape for a very long time, but it's important to realize that they are an invasive non-native animal. I, I call them feral hogs because they are that. They go by a lot of different names. Some of the names are fun. They're called um, in, razorbacks in some part of the country. The favorite name I've encountered so far is river rooter. <laughs> and they're, they're all the same species. They're all, the scientific name is Sus scrofa. So that applies to domestic pig. That applies to Eurasian wild boar. That applies to feral hogs, swine. They're all in the same umbrella, and that means they can all interbreed. And so what we have in the landscape is a feral non-native animal. And so if you look at the ancestry in Texas, we have kind of two big introductions. One was free-ranging livestock that was put on the landscape all the way back to Spanish explorers. You can go way back to when they were introduced, but that practice continued over hundreds of years. And then in the early 1900s, late 1800s, um, across the country, there had been a lot of market hunting going on. And so a lot of our native populations of game species were very low. There weren't a lot as many hunting opportunities. And so the people that had the means to hunt were bringing over exotic animals. And so they looked over at Europe and they said, huh, well, Eurasian wild boar have been a really popular species to hunt for literally thousands of years. They're challenging, they're exciting. Let's bring some of those over. And so they were put on game preserves. Sometimes they were intentionally interbred with the feral hogs already in the landscape. Sometimes hog-proof fences aren't actually hog-proof. Um, and so they were able to get out. Um, there are specific examples of hurricanes coming through and taking down fences. And so what we have on the landscape in Texas today is a super fun cross between pure Eurasian wild boar and released domestic swine, so feral swine. Now, when you think about that equation, domestic animals, whether it's, it's swine, it's cattle, whatever things we have domesticated for food, we've got some specific goals. We want them to reproduce quickly. We want them to reproduce in large numbers. We want them to start being reproductively active early, grow quickly. These things are really good in an animal that's producing meat for you. And then we picked out Eurasian wild boar because they're really smart. They're really challenging. And so you can see the direction we're going here. We have that cross on our landscape today, and that, that background is why this animal is so resilient, so successful, so highly reproductive, and able to expand so quickly across our landscape. So we have feral hogs documented, and I think we have over, we have close to 300 counties. It's like 254. I get my numbers mixed up. So um, we have 254 counties in Texas. We have feral hogs in 252 of them. So they are abundant. They are across the landscape here. And we see, I mean, damage. We could talk about damage literally for hours, but just to the, give you the brief scope of all the different areas they affect. Um, they, in agriculture, they affect our row crops. They compete with livestock for food resources. They carry diseases that are transmissible to livestock. When we look at our natural resources, they're damaging watersheds. They're ruining native plants in some areas. Their, their foraging behavior, like like their fun name, River Rooter. So they concentrate on areas of water and they're rooting in the ground using their snout to look for things underground, whether it's grubs, roots, things like that. They're, they're an omnivore, but they're targeting stuff underground. And so they're digging up the ground all over the place and a lot of times concentrating in more sensitive environments around the water. So they're competing with native wildlife. Again, as a non-native animal, everything they eat, everything they take off the landscape wasn't put here for feral hogs. That's on our landscape as a resource for our native animals. It's there, it's got a purpose, it's designed to feed something else. So they're competing with our native animals. I said omnivore. In some cases, they're eating our native animals. They're disrupting habitat. They also carry diseases that are transmissible to our native wildlife. And then just moving along that strain, we look at the effects directly to humans. They carry diseases that are transmissible to our pets, diseases that are transmissible to humans. They damage any sort of open field space, that's really prime area for feral hogs. So we see golf courses, we see sports fields, we see neighborhoods. There, <laughs> there's damage caused by these animals in a lot of different areas. And like I said, they're across the state. So a lot of us are feeling this pressure from these pigs and we're experiencing these damage in a, a lot of different areas. So that's the short version. <laughs>
<laughs> they are edible um, if you cook them to 165 degrees. I mentioned diseases. I would recommend wearing gloves the entire time you're processing the meat. And fun fact: the the specific disease of concern for transmitting to from hogs to humans. There are several, but the bad one is swine brucellosis. Now, freezing it, if you were to butcher an animal, package it nicely, put it in the freezer, take it out in your kitchen, just because it was frozen doesn't mean that if that disease was there, it was gotten rid of. So even at your home, in your kitchen, if you're handling feral hog meat, we recommend wearing gloves. I am a little bit prone to nicking my fingers in the kitchen. And so if I'm handling that kind of meat, I'm going to be wearing cut-proof gloves until I'm done cooking it, just as, as an own precaution for myself. The more I delve down that rabbit hole, the more I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the precautions necessary. <laughs> So I actually run a website. Um, it's feralhogs.tamu.edu. And I, I have the information up there. We have a lot of background information on feral hogs. I'm working on some management-specific pages to put up there. But we already have all of our feral hog-related publications consolidated on that website. So there's a lot, like you said, really specific stuff. If you want to learn how to build a pig-specific snare, that's on there. If you want to learn how to build a certain kind of head gate for a trap, that's on there. And then also... My email and my phone number are on there. So yes, I do take I do take questions from um, across the state. Honestly, I get questions from across the country about specific issues, and I'm I'm always happy to answer them or, or get them pointed in the right direction.